I'm Mosh or Michelle Wee, director at the IPFS Foundation. Hi, Hello. Mosh. Hi, Peter. <laughs> I've been seeing you here. So for people who don't know you, can you tell a few words about yourself and what you do? Sure. Uh, my name is Mosh or Michelle Wee. I'm director at the IPFS Foundation. Um, and uh, before that, I was at Protocol Lab. So IPFS uh, is a 10-year-old project. It started initially to be a, a censorship-resistant, resilient, open way to share, um, publish and share information across the internet. Since then, we've noticed that people have used its building blocks to make all sorts of things across Web2 and Web3. And um, uh, yeah, really built around the idea of um, content address building blocks and peer-to-peer -peer networking. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, can you expand more on IPFS, like how it emerged and how is it going now? Yeah. Um, so when there is so much information being passed around the web, I think, uh, you know, trillions and trillions of uh, um, of files, data points, you know, um, nodes across the public and private networks. Um, IPFS um, is this idea that uh, information should be efficient, it should be resilient. And so right now, if you download a file, it gets a file, you give it a file name, and then you can never find it again. You have to download the you know ninth copy yeah. of that PDF. Right? Yeah, especially if you don't name it yourself. Yes. And, then and it's like, impossible. computers should be smarter than that, right? yeah. because we know yeah. the contents of that yeah. file are the same, so we should be able to give you the same thing or be able to fetch it from your neighbor instead of fetching it from a server in Virginia mm -hmm. or a server in Berlin or wherever. Um, and so IPFS introduces this idea of content fingerprinting. Um, it's been used in other systems like Git as, as well. Um, but IPFS takes that and, and uh, basically build the tree of your entire data set or your entire file, gives unique fingerprints at, at every level. And so you can use those to compose um, subsets of your data or verify parts of your data um, and just give you much more reliable ways to, um, to address data. <laughs> And now once you have those more reliable ways to address data, it means you can verify uh, a software distribution. It means you can check that data sets haven't been tampered with. It means that you can you know, um, compose, uh, um, compose files from lots of different sources. And then the, the uh, verification or the certification lives with the data instead of who you put it from. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And you also mentioned that people build on you as well, something, right? Uh, yes. What is the example? Like, uh, what, what is possible? <laughs> so we work, um, we collaborated with a group called uh, the Starlink Framework uh -huh. for Data Integrity, and they use IPFS to um, timestamp and authenticate video testimony of uh, humanitarian events around the world. We also have scientists who use IPFS to manage scientific data sets. Um, and, uh, and and provide more reliable references to them. Um, uh, and the building blocks of IPFS are also used in um, open social networks uh, like Blue Sky. Yeah. Okay. And uh, who? I mean, you can address to people and say like, "Oh, come do something with us or on us." Like, uh, what are those people, and to what can they possibly do as well? Like, yeah. Well, in the past, it's it's funny inside my own career in technology, we've seen this arc from like uh, very hands-on, accessible, participatory mm -hmm. um, building through the consolidation of control uh, of of big tech, and uh, what the movement that we're a part of is is trying to bring control and um, an agency back to users, builders, developers. So with IPFS components, you can build um, applications where uh, the controller authority doesn't rest with a central service or a business, but that, that um, where the authority or verification sits a lot closer to the data. And so you can make self-certifying systems, um, whether it's for social or identity or you know, large-scale com computation, um, and have that data be more portable across networks and across systems. Yeah, we at Web3 Privacy now, we totally support this movement towards like being more agent and having more agency and like owning things. Um, what do you think like average user can do like to have more agency like in, in general in web 2 and web 3 life um like besides ipfs like maybe tools or behavior like how to be more private and conscious on web in general <laughs> um 
Let me try to think and and frame it a little bit. Um, I think the first thing uh, people can do is to be more educated mm -hmm. about surveillance capitalism, all of the ways that our information data is tracked and then sold and shared um, across large large scale companies. So. Um, understanding what a cookie is, understanding what uh, what logins do, understanding what OAuth, you know, what kind of data is shared at every kind of login or um, or account creation, um, and then uh, understanding data retention, you know, how how different services you opt into retain your data. Hundred percent. Uh, can you recommend any maybe educational resources, videos, books, whatever, on the topics that will enrich this understanding? <laughs> I think what you're built is, is not helpful. Oh yeah, thank it, you. What yeah, you're yeah. But we okay. have a but, uh, but we privacy academy. We have a course just in case you don't know. Uh, privacy one hundred and one. We expand on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, no, I, don't, I don't feel like there's a. I don't have a good like a good single resource. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. That's why we actually made this academy and we made this one-on-one -on -one course in privacy because there's so many information in privacy, mm -hmm. but it's so scattered. Yeah. It's like everywhere, and there is no a single point of entry for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think what people should know is to start from a foundation of understanding that these uh, large corporations are um, you're stealing our attention mm -hmm. and our history um, and monetizing that. So they're yeah. taking capital value that we've created, our, our digital footprints, and then combining it at tremendous scale to kind of extract value from you know, all of the user base. So um, you know, once, once you understand that, then it becomes, um, then it becomes uh, much more compelling to be more privacy conscious because um, not only do you, do you not want to be monetized against your will and against your participation, um, but you also you know want to avoid the surveillance that comes with that. <laughs> yeah, um, I read somewhere that you were uh, doing some sort of messaging for a government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you expand on that? Like, what's that, and how does it work? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I mean. Governments are are one entity that has yeah. to communicate with its resident citizens on like the largest scales possible, right? And um, in the 2010s, I think we we were still living this era of techno optimism, and so technology can facilitate things, make everything smoother and better. Um, in the United States, there's a tradition of public participation mm -hmm. that happens primarily in person in the evenings, you know, 6 p.m. on a weekday. A lot of people can't get there and participate, and so as a result, you have a skewed um, very skewed representation where only people who have the free time and resources yeah, yeah. get their voices represented. So, so it's like parents and young life, kids aren't yeah. there, people who have to work can't yeah. get there. Um, and so um, a lot of the public officials were saying, we, we know there are different voices out there. Can you help us um, consolidate them and, and, and reach people? And so we built uh, interactive text messaging systems mm -hmm. for uh, governments to ask user, uh, you know, ask ask residents like, where should we put this new resource, or you know, how should we build this new bike share system? Um, and it did end up getting much more representative mm -hmm. participation. Um, so I think you know, technology is a, it's just a tool; it's an accelerator. Yeah. Um, it can be used for good, it can be used for bad. Um, and I think now, as builders, we need to be especially conscious that it can be used for all sorts of purposes, but. Oh, some motivation. Well, yeah, considering politics nowadays, <laughs> do you think, <laughs> what do you think we can do still? Because it's getting harder and harder, right? Uh, to build resilient infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is a way to kind of oppose this like right swing we are having now? I think, um, I think technologists need to understand that we're part of a complex system that, you know, Technology is shaped by policy, policy shapes technology, and then all of those are shaped by people's voices and demands and and um, and their presence. And so um, building technology now is very different than building technology 20 years ago where we thought all technology was, was going to make humanity more efficient and more empowered. I think we have to understand um, how to work with, collaborate with, as well as you know challenge 
uh, these systems of policy and authority so that we're ultimately creating better societies. Speaking about better societies, so uh, imagine the web of your dream, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, private, secure, uh, whatever, uh, decentralized, mm -hmm. like in some distant future. Um, how would it look like? And how would life look like in this like, ideal circumstances? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to me, online life is a reflection or extension of uh, in-person life. It's, mm -hmm. it, to me, they're not you know, parallel realities. They're, they're kind of along a spectrum of the same. And we have um, the tradition, you know, the, the culture behind uh, privacy first. Sorry. I'm going to back up a bit. Um, it, it's really interesting that there's a shared community um, and a lot of shared ethos between people who are privacy advocates for the web and also advocates for the open web. Mm -hmm. So how can these two seemingly um, uh, opposite ideas live in the same people, live in the same communities? I think it comes down to having control um, and having choice over whether something's public or private. And our tools in the past have been on both extremes. You have like very private, secure messengers, or you have um, completely open, you know, censorship resistant publishing tools. Um, I think what people and communities need increasingly is um, ways to create sub communities within kind of the the um, the the uh, everything that's going on across the whole web. You know. In reality, people want their experience to be across, you know, three people, five mm -hmm. people, even 500 people. And so um, we increasingly need tools that help create these sub-communities within the, the broader web. Okay, um, <clears throat> okay from, uh, let's say, business or builder perspective, uh, so some of your lessons learned uh, in IPFS, um, like, how to build a resilient tech nowadays, like what you can recommend for someone who is building or running something like that. Mm -hmm. um, my, uh, the thing I would really like all builders to know is that you have an early adopter group that is going to be very experimental and um, uh, very receptive to new technologies and very tolerant of frictions. Um, but if you really want to reshape the web to make it more private as a whole, then these um, principles and patterns need to be baked into the tools that are just appealing to everyone because they're convenient. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, you, you, people will sometimes make choices for ethical reasons, but they also have a lot of other pressures in their life. So you need to make sure that the convenient choice is also the safe, you know, the the, the privacy first choice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it makes sense. Make that... it, like, make it easy for users to make the right yeah. decision. Yeah, 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 that's true. I think uh, so many people, so many companies overlook like UX and, and basically being human centric. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so be human centric, please. <laughs> if you build something. Um, okay. Uh, Beyond yeah. human centric, I yeah. think, um, and I spent seven years as a UX designer. Mm. So that whole time we were just optimizing your individual experience. Yeah. I think that that practice has changed. We're understanding that optimizing your individual experience to you know, um, increase engagement, increase retention, often um, just gives more value back mm -hmm. to the, the tech monopolies. So what we're really wanting to do is make sure people are building software that um, that facilitates systems or workflows or you know um, patterns, mm -hmm. right? So ultimately, are you trying to um, create more connection? Are you trying to create more high quality connection? Are you trying to make um, a certain workflow really easy? Um, think about what you're enabling and make those things um, uh, your goal rather than building for any one specific individual. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, but. Yeah, unfortunately, we have to round up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Marsh, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks for watching. <laughs> Ciao.